Perfect. Well, good evening, everybody, which is not many if you're streaming in, uh, but it's very nice to be here tonight to have the third of Uncle Mur's classes on Zephaniah. Um, amusingly, the first hymn that's been chosen is Cry Out and Shout, so I think that might be necessary uh, to get much sound out of this hall, but uh, whoever's here is warm and welcome, so um, we'll start with hymn and prayer, and our hymn will be 28. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that man that will one day rule from your city of Jerusalem, the city which, instead of being the offscouring of the earth, will be high and elevated, the place that draws all nations because of the righteous rule of your Son, will draw the nations to being attracted by his, his peace and his equity, his justice, his care of the poor and needy, his execution of right judgment throughout the world, his implementation of your principles by which man is elevated from his natural state to live a much better life. Our loving Heavenly Father, we long for that day when the city of Jerusalem will be loved and adored in the world and when your Son will rule 
with righteousness and justice. Our loving Father, we thank you today for all the blessings that you surround us with. Thank you tonight and for the last few weeks, the beautiful sunsets we've seen, which remind us of your majesty and your glory. Lord God, in a world of unrest and turmoil and war and instability, financial and social, we pray, loving God, that your word might register in our hearts again tonight, that you'll hear our prayer, loving God, for those who need your special care. We rejoice, our loving Father, at the birth of Brother Samuel Lund, a new child in Christ of Barossa Ecclesia. We pray that you'll be with him in this walk. And Lord God, as we remember members that we have laid to rest recently and today, we pray, loving God, for the Archer family and for those who reflect upon our brother Reg. A hundred years of, of life given of you, an astute brother and earnest in the things of the truth. Our loving Father, we long for the day of the resurrection morning when he, with our sister Audrey, will, will rise, glorious within, clothed upon with immortality. Our loving Father, we are thankful for these two very steadfast and committed members of our community. Those who have gone before, who have laid the pathway, who have built ecclesias and supported them. Our loving Father, we thank you for faith which is seen over such long length of life, persistent faith, despite the ups and downs of the world around us. Our loving Father, we remember tonight as we gather, though small in number, we remember our members who are on holidays, our young people at study week around the words of our Lord in Matthew 5 to 7. We pray your blessing upon them all. We bear before you again, Brother Gary and the Penn family. Lord God, give us all, and them in particular, the strength to bear the trials they go through. And as we open tonight that stern word of the prophet Zephaniah, our loving Father, we pray that you'll keep your face open toward us, that we might be diligently seeking you, building a relationship, a closeness, an open-heartedness, a tender, malleable heart. Loving God, help us to be preparing in this, the end of our era, the end of the age, for the coming of our Lord. We pray, loving God, knowing that the day is near, and whenever, whenever it comes, for we know not the day nor the hour, only the season, we pray that we might be encouraging each other till the very last, building each other up in our common and inspirational hope not losing sight of the wonderful things which have been promised to us. Lord God, be with us, we pray. Teach us your way and knit us together around the things which have been shown to us and promised to us in your word. We offer this prayer and ask for your blessing on our night. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome Uncle Roger, that makes another 10% of our membership here tonight. Um, we will now uh, read Zephaniah chapter 3, this is the, the third night on Zephaniah. Um, so the final chapter, this one has a little more uh, glory and hope in it, and James will read that for us. Thanks James. Reading together Zephaniah chapter 3. Woe to her who is, a re who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressed city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in Yahweh. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing until the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. Yahweh within her is righteous. 
he does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust know no shame. I have cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruin. I have laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not have been cut off according to all that I appointed against you. But all the more, they were eager to make their deeds corrupt. Therefore, wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed." For at that time, I'll change the speech of the people to a pure speech, that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds which you have rebelled against me. Then I'll remove from your midst your proud, exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I'll leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of Yahweh, those who are left in Israel. They shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. Yahweh, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his, by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of, who, of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors and will save the lame and will gather the outcasts and I will sh change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time... I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together, for I, will make, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. So we look forward to Uncle Mary's words, Zephaniah, Justice and Hope, our third class now. Thank you very much, Samuel. Just straighten this. Excuse me. <clears throat> well, brethren, sisters and young people, uh, our study tonight is the uh, title shows, uh, concerns justice and hope. Justice on the, on the part of Yahweh for bringing the judgments upon Judah and Jerusalem, showing that those were just, but at the same time also showing that Yahweh was presenting before his people hope, the hope of restoration, the hope of of the great blessings of the kingdom age. And so in chapter 3 and verse 1, we read, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city. And the he her here is, of course, Jerusalem, the oppressing city. It says in verse 2, She obeyed not the voice, uh, and she received not correction. But in verse 1 it talks about her that is filthy and polluted 
and the oppressing city. The word filthy there, I think it came in the, out in the translation James was reading as well tonight, uh, actually means rebellious. It's actually the word, word Mara. It's the same pretty much as Miriam and Mara. So it means bitter or unpleasant and therefore to rebel or to resist. She's also described Jerusalem as polluted, which has the idea of freeing, that is repudi repudiating or desecrating. And she's described as the oppressing city, which means to, be, to rage or be violent, to suppress, to maltreat. And this was the character, sadly, of the population of Judah, rebellious, polluted, and violent. And so there are four failures in uh, verse 2. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in Yahweh, she drew, drew not near to her God. And again in James's translation it really picked it up because in the um, in Hebrew, it's actually, the word not there is the word no, lo, if you know a bit of Hebrew. So, it's all a case of negation. There was no obedience of the voice, there was no receiving of correction, there was no trusting in Yahweh, and there was no drawing near to God. She obeyed not, the word for obeyed is shema, which really means to hear, and because one hears intelligently, one obeys. And for ourselves, there's an exhortation there in Romans 6 and 17, that we might obey from the heart that form of doctrine. By the way, there's copies of these uh, slides if you want to save writing down. Um, but by all means, it's good to be marking things down. She received not correction, or as the word really should be, instruction. And so once again, the Proverbs exhort us to receive instruction. And she trusted not in Yahweh. And so much throughout the Psalms particularly, we have the encouragement to trust in Yahweh, as in Psalm 37 and verses 3 to 5. And finally, she drew not near to her God. And James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to thee. So these are four failures of Jerusalem. The uh, Young's Literal Translation has it this way, she hath not hearkened to the voice, she hath not accepted instruction, in Yahweh she hath not trusted, Unto her God she hath not drawn near. And so in this sad situation, in verse 3, we read the character of the rulers and the other important people in Jerusalem. Her princes, verse 3, within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They ignore not the bones till the morrow. Verse 4, the, her prophets are light and treacherous persons, her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So within her, it says in verse 3, it's actually the same word as in the midst, which we'll pick up a bit later, but in verse 5, for instance, you have in the midst thereof. So really it should be her princes in the midst of her are roaring lions. So there's no mention of the king there, of Josiah, um, but the princes or those of the, the leading family were described as roaring lions, demanding and intimidating. And the judges or the administrators are called evening wolves. And as wolves under, uh, feed under cover of darkness, the judges were secretly perverting justice. And this rather odd phrase at the end there, they gnaw not the bones till tomorrow, 
the RSV has, and I think again James's translation picked this up, has leave nothing till the morning. They leave nothing to the morning. So the point that's been made here is that nothing is visible in the morning. Even as the bones were consumed by the wolves, so no evidence of injustice by the judges could be seen. It was all well hidden. There was nothing to see. The judges made sure it was all well hidden and covered up. And so it goes on to say in verse 4 that the prophets are light and treacherous persons. And we'll just uh, look this one up in Jeremiah 23. In Jeremiah 23 and verse 32. And Jeremiah, of course, was contemporary with uh, Zephaniah. And Jeremiah 30, uh, 23 and verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, says Yahweh, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith Yahweh. So Jeremiah describes these prophets with their, their false dreams, causing the people to err by their lightness. And this, in fact, was the situation with the prophets in the time of Zephaniah. And he also calls reference in chapter 3 of Zephaniah again to the priests. The priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. And so there was no sense of holiness in worship. The priests should have been leading the people, but they had violated the law, as Young's literal translation says. So it was a hopeless situation, and yet it shows the justice of Yahweh in bringing his judgments upon Judah and Jerusalem. In verse 5, by contrast, it says, The just Yahweh in the midst thereof, and as we said before, that's the same as phrase as in verse 3, within. So on the one hand, in the midst of Jerusalem, in the midst of the nation, you have all this corruption. On the other hand, you have, in verse 5, the just Yahweh in the midst thereof, he will not do in iniquity. Every morning doth he bring forth his judgment to light. He, fa he faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. And so, in contrast to the unjust leaders of Jerusalem and Judah, Yahweh is righteous and daily cares for his creation and for his people. And so in verse 6 we read, I have cut off the nations, their towers are desolate. I have made their streets waste, that none passed by. Their cities are destroyed, so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. And there's essentially two senses that this um, verse is getting at. First of all, that all these nations that have been cut off and made desolate and so on, that had been done for the preservation of Judah and Israel. God had done, overthrown those, those nations and those uh, kingdoms to preserve Judah. And on the other hand, it's the warning to Judah and Jerusalem if God had cut off the nations, the Gentile nations, made them desolate, virtually to the point where there's no inhabitant, then that could also happen to, Ju to Judah, the kingdom of Judah. And of course, we know that was the outcome. And so in verse 7, Yahweh says, I, I said, surely they will fear me. They will receive instruction. So their dwelling should not be cut off. However, I punished them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. 
And so God's judgments had no effect on Judah. The limited judgments that were brought upon them to try and bring them back in the right way. They were early in their pursuit of evil, as it says there, that they rose early and corrupted their ways. And yet God, in his faithfulness and long-suffering, was, uh, was continuing to preserve them and his long-suffering towards them was clearly evident. And so, in verse 8, we have a shift in the um, shift in the in the words of the prophet. Although notice that almost all the way through this prophecy, the words are of Yahweh Himself. And so, in verse eight, we read, "Therefore wait ye upon me," or as it should be, and was again in James's translation, "Therefore wait ye for me," says. Yahweh, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And so Yahweh says, wait, wait for me, wait ye for me, because he's addressing the meek back in chapter 2 and verse 3 who are asked to seek Yahweh all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment seek righteousness, seek meekness it may be ye shall be hid in the day of Yahweh's anger and so Yahweh says wait ye, you meek ones wait upon or wait for me till the day comes of the day of judgment And to wait is to properly adhere to something, to stick to something, and hence await. And as we said, it's addressed to the meek um, who wait for Yahweh. If we go across to that reference there, Isaiah 8 and verse 17, here we have one of the meek in Isaiah waiting on Yahweh. In Isaiah 8 and verse 17, the prophet says, I will wait upon Yahweh that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. So remember back to our original, probably the first class, talking about Yahweh has hidden his face from his people being connected to the name of Zephaniah. And so Yahweh hides his face and those that are faithful to him will wait for him, which is the sense of Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. Wait ye upon me, or wait ye for me, saith Yahweh, until the day that I rise up to the prey. And so, in effect, rising up to the prey is a a summary of the coming great day of Yahweh upon all nations. It's the scene of Joel 3, Habakkuk 3, Isaiah 24, Zechariah, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Revelation 14, 19 and so on. The judgment on the nations. And Yahweh says, my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the, assemble the um, kingdoms. His determination, it's the word mishpat, which really means judgment. In this case, it's a decision. It can mean a decision. And in this case, a right, because it is right for Yahweh as sovereign over his creation to determine how his judgments will fall. And he says he's going to gather the nations. And this is a worldwide effect 
in Armageddon and the judgments following. There's a number of references there on the slide um, of this repeated phrase of God saying he's going to gather the nations. In Isaiah 66, 18, I will gather all nations in Joel 3, 2. He'll gather them as sheaves in Micah 4, verse 12. And in Revelation 16, he will gather them together in the place called Armageddon. So God's judgments will be worldwide in their effect as those judgments are poured out upon the nation. And it talks about the fire of his jealousy, the fire of my jealousy. And if we just go across to Isaiah 42, sorry, this is not on the slide, Uh, Isaiah 42 and verse 13, Isaiah 42, 13, Yahweh shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time, says Yahweh, holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once, and so the chapter goes on. So the fire of God's jealousy being poured out at that time, his fierce anger that shall be poured out, all the earth being devoured by the fire of his jealousy. But then in verse 9, it starts to talk about the effects of God's judgments in the earth. says, for then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of Yahweh to serve him with one consent. He will turn them to a pure language. The margin of the AV has a pure lip, because often language is used in the sense of lip. And the confusion of languages or lips back in a time of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 is going to be replaced, says Yahweh, with a pure language. And possibly that may be Hebrew. Uh, Interestingly, there is a government body in Israel right from the beginning which oversees the purity of Hebrew. You can't just add words in like we do in English, not officially anyway. You have to wait until there's a word um, for whatever you want to talk about before you can use, speak about it in Hebrew, which does seem very complex. But Israel's trying to keep the language pure. Well, pure can mean clean, clear, and their lips were unclean because of using names of false gods and worshipping them. You remember Malcolm back in chapter one, and of course Baal, Ashtaroth, all those names. And so when it talks about unclean lips, or lips that are not pure, it is talking about the things that are spoken through those lips. And in this case, uh, it's presenting this positively, but it's also also reflecting on the fact that in the past, Judah, Israel, had worshipped these false deities and their names had been upon their lips. But the point here in verse 9 is that there will be no more confusion but clear, pure words and thinking. And it says that they may call upon the name of Yahweh, that they may call upon the name of Yahweh with one consent And they can call upon the name of Yahweh because the exclusive relationship has been restored with Israel and extended to all the nations. That exclusive relationship is possible because they now speak the same language, so to speak, as Yahweh himself. And they will serve with one consent. 
And the word consent there is actually shechem, the shoulder. So there will be a complete dedication of the people, not only Israel, but all people, heart, soul, mind and strength, as Deuteronomy 6 says, a complete dedication to God himself and his worship. Just come across to Psalm 100. Beautiful psalm, talking about the kingdom age and effect upon all nations. Psalm 100. <clears throat> Make a joyful noise unto Yahweh, all ye lands. Verse 2. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And so they will. They will serve with one consent. There'll be a full dedication. They will come before his presence with gladness and singing. And so that will be not just the case of Israel, but the whole world as time develops. So coming back to uh, Zephaniah 3 and to verse 10. Again, this is a little bit of an odd verse. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. It seems as though... Um, the words are, are sort of a little bit mixed here, a bit out of order. Um, but in effect, what it's saying is the distant Gentile nations shall bring the dispersed of Israel as a present to Yahweh. And that's mentioned in a couple of other places in the scriptures, in Isaiah 66, 20 and Isaiah 18. Uh, but the Cambridge Bible renders it this way. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia shall they bring my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, as my offering. Probably should have put that one on the screen for you, but I'll just go over it again. From be beyond the rivers of Ethiopia shall they bring my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, as my offering. So you see what it's done? It's moved the reference to the offering uh, making it the suppliants uh, being brought as the offering rather than verse 10 in Zephaniah seems to suggest the supp suppliants are bringing the offering whereas in fact the offering is the suppliants does that make sense <clears throat> and so from verse 11 on we have a transformed nation Verse 11, in that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then will I take away out of the midst of them that rejoice in thy pride and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. They will no longer be ashamed, says the prophet. Judah shall be purged of her sins and arrogance and when they are confronted with the realisation that they have rejected and killed their Messiah. And those would rejoice in pride, so there will be no more arrogance, as it says in the, my holy mountain. So there will be a removal of pride and haughtiness of Israel when they are stunned by the fact that their Messiah is in fact the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in verse 12, I will leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of Yahweh. So no longer trusting in themselves, but humbled and able to call upon the name, Yahweh will leave this group of people that trust in his name. And in verse 13, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in her, their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. 
So neither a deceitful tongue shall be found in their mouth. No iniquity, no lies, no deceit. We have here a reformed and purified nation. And that phrase, none shall make them afraid, um, I'm sure has echoes, doesn't it? But in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 10, if we just go there, Again, a well-known, very well-known chapter. Jeremiah 30 and verse 10. Therefore, fear thou not, Jeremiah 30, 10, O my servant Jacob, saith Yahweh, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. And so that is God's purpose, that the fears that Israel, the Jewish people have lived under all their lives over the last 2,000 years, in that day none shall make them afraid, when they are finally restored to favour and living at peace. And so in verse 14, there is a song and a shout, as we sang in our opening, opening hymn. In verse 14, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. What a contrast to chapter 1 and chapter 2, to some degree, in relation to Israel and to Zion and Jerusalem. Here they are, uh, uh, are told by Yahweh to sing and to shout. A song of deliverance, for great is the Holy One in the midst of them. And a shout, and if you think about it, the shout when, when Jericho fell a representation of the time in the future when great Babylon shall come into remembrance and judgment by God. So there will be a shout, as Joshua 6 and verse 20 says, hear the fall of all, nation, all Israel's enemies back in the time of Joshua, the fall of that great city. And so, verse 15, Yahweh hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even Yahweh, is in the midst of thee, and thou shalt not see evil any more. Thou shalt not see evil any more. So Yahweh's face had been hidden from his people, but his face is hidden no longer. And there's a couple of references that is there. We've got a bit of time, so, or rather we have time, I think, to look at them. So Isaiah 54 and verse 8. Isaiah 54 and verse 8 says, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. It's only a few thousand years. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith Yahweh, thy Redeemer. So once again we're picking up this theme of the face of God. I hid my face for a moment, says Yahweh. And this, uh, Ezekiel 39, is quite remarkable. It's an amazing chapter. Ezekiel 39 and verse... 23. Now this is after Armageddon, this is after Gog has been overthrown in chapter 38, 39. And this is what God says, he says, the, the heathen or the nation shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me, therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies 
so fell they all by the sword, according to their uncleanness, and according to their transgressions have I done unto them, and hid my face from them. And then down in verse 29, neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith Adonai Yahweh. What a remarkable thing. God had hidden his face from them, but he says there's going to come a time where I'll never hide my face from them again, and I will pour out my spirit upon them. So Yahweh's face had been hidden from his people, as Zephaniah's name implied. Yahweh is hidden, but now his face is no longer hidden from his people. And all because of God's faithfulness to the fathers of Israel, they were going to be res- they will be restored with joy. And so verse 16 says, Fear not, and to Zion, uh, verse 16, sorry, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. So God says they will fear not, and their hands will not be slack. Because, verse 17, Yahweh thy God is in the midst of thee, and he is mighty. And that phrase, in the midst, is picked up in chapter 3 several times. Uh, If you remember, we looked at it earlier, chapter 3 and verse 3, speaking of the princes within her, or in the midst of her, uh, in verse 5, the just Yahweh is in the midst thereof. And verse 11, he will take away out of the midst thereof those that rejoiced in pride and so on. In verse 12, he is going to leave in the midst of them an inflicted and poor people. And in verse 15, he has taken away thy judgments, the king of Israel. Even Yahweh is in the midst of thee. And here in verse 17, Yahweh thy God in the midst of thee. (coughs) And he is mighty. And he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. And so Yahweh will save. He will save his people, as Jeremiah 30 verse 10 says. And he will rejoice, as Isaiah 65 says, and rest in his love, again Jeremiah 31 3, and he will joy with singing. And in verse 18, he will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, to whom the, appro- the reproach of it was a burden. And so those who are grieving, as the word for sorrowful there, they they are grieving for the solemn assembly. They will be, um, and those who were a reproach, they, they will be restored once again. And so in verse 19, Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. So God is going to gather those who halt. And that, of course, is the sense of limping and the sense or rather reference there back to Jacob, recalling Jacob's condition after he had wrestled with the angel and obtained the blessing. And so as Jacob wrestled with God, so for the nation often also called Jacob, the wrestling now is over. The nation has wrestled with God all through the ages and now that has all ceased. I will save her, says Yahweh, that halteth. 
and now they have received, received when he saves them the blessing of Jacob and the fathers of Israel. And verse, verse uh, sorry, I just missed my, I think it was verse 20, but it's verse 9. Verse 19 goes on to say that I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. And so over the centuries, the Jewish people have been humiliated, persecuted, massacred, hunted, etc. And now that is in the past. Even today, anti-Semitism sadly is alive and powerful in the world. And so verse 20, at that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make your name and a praise make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith Yahweh. And the word there for captivity has the sense of prisoners, those who are in prison. And so as Israel really, Jewish people, uh, have always been limited in their freedom wherever they have lived. In the future, that will be brought to an end. And that captivity, that prison house, will be destroyed. It will be opened. And he will, Yahweh will turn these things back before their eyes. And that, of course, is a reference to a face again. The eyes are in the face. And Yahweh says, I'll, re I'll turn back your captivity before your eyes. In other words, before your face. And number six, which we'll sing in the anthem uh, at the end of our meeting, uh, says, Yahweh bless thee and keep thee and make his face to shine upon thee. But I'd like you to go to Psalm 67 because... It's an interesting little psalm which really sums up what Zephaniah is talking about here. It's only a short psalm, Psalm 67. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. See that that thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even their own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear thee. And really, I think that sums up the book of Zephaniah to a large extent, because that's the, that's the future for Israel. Yahweh will be merciful unto them and cause his face to shine upon them. Now, the book of Zephaniah opened with the words in verse 1, the word of Yahweh which came to Zephaniah. And we saw, I think, how there's a constant repetition of I will, I will. In fact, in these last few verses, from verse 17 of chapter 3 through to the end, uh, if you happen to have coloured coloured in the I wills, it's almost every word in every sentence has been coloured coloured in. Verse seventeen, Yahweh is mighty; He will save; He will rejoice, and so on. And right down to verse twenty, at that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make your name a praise, you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. And the book ends with, I will turn back your cavity, 
captivity before your eyes, saith Yahweh. So the book opens with the word of Yahweh came to Zephaniah and it ends with saith Yahweh. So the divine endorsement, the divine authority of the book of Zephaniah is stamped and thus the last word is Yahweh's. Just a few final thoughts on the book of Zephaniah. Like Zephaniah's time, the great day of Yahweh is near for us too. The lesson for us is that before, the, before that day, we need to seek Yahweh. It may be we shall be hid in the day of God's anger. So then let us wait for our loving God and be glad and rejoice with all our hearts in his goodness promised to his people and promised to us. Thank you, Samuel. prophecy and what a beautiful verse in verse 17 there that we considered Yahweh thy God in the midst of thee is mighty so his judgments will be seen against his people at the start of the book and finally acting on behalf of his people at the end he will save thee he will rejoice over thee with joy and as the next little expression is he will quiet you with his love he will joy over thee with singing what a beautiful tender thought the almighty God having that disposition towards his people so thanks very much, Uncle Mer, for putting in so much time to open this book up for us over the last three classes. Um, don't forget the handouts that are down here at the front um, that Uncle Mer has prepared as well, just to facilitate a bit of Bible marking from the slides. And by way of uh, announcements tonight, the collection if you could EFT it or put it in the box, is for the support of the mission fields, the ACBM. Our next class is to be one of our feast class classes. It will be led by Brother Luke Nichols on the Feast of Passover. And then the following class after that will be readings in the home, which is always enjoyable. This Sunday, God willing, uh, too many people away for Sunday school, so there's no Sunday school, but projects are due to be handed to Sister Jenny Steadman, on Sunday, Brother Jonathan Pan is to exhort and Tim Pan is to be the chairman and Sister Annette is to play for us. And on Sunday night, uh, Brother Peter Osborne is to speak on the promises to Abraham. So we look forward to that. We'll close then with this very fitting hymn um, with God lifting up his face upon us, how these things reflect into our own lives and our relevance for ourselves. Hymn 66 to be followed in prayer by Brother John.
God, may indeed your face shine upon us. Thank you, God, that tonight we've been able to come to learn about your word. And as we've seen tonight, God, there is so much in there of what you have said to your people and so much for us to learn. And we've seen tonight a contrast, a contrast in the way the people of Israel had lived, the life of those, the life of the princes, the life of those people who obeyed you not. We've seen this, God, and we've seen this also in our world. We've seen this amongst ourselves, God. We know that we are sinners. And God, we see in this book of Zephaniah the great hope that the world is to change. And God, we put our trust in you that we might be part of you. And we put our faith in that world that is to come when your son, Lord Jesus Christ, will return. We pray that we may be with him on that day, that we may be able to participate and be part of the world where your glory does shine, where we can see the world where it ought to be and we see the evil done away with. And God, let us always have the vision in our mind of that great future time when the world will change. And in the meantime, God, please strengthen us through in the needs that we have. We ask that you would uh, be with us this week to come, that, that you might be with us all in our health. It's particularly, God, in our spiritual health, that we may not forget what we have heard tonight as we go out into this next week. We thank you for all the blessings that we do have, God, and we thank you for the food that we have now, as we do for all those blessings we have from you each day. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.